All right, so welcome again. This is the fifth segment of the ORCID US Community Showcase webinar series. My name is Sheila Rabin and I am the ORCID US Community Specialist at Lyricist. I'm going to start us off today with a brief overview of ORCID and the ORCID US Community and then we'll hear from Shauna Sadler at ORCID with a brief global overview. And then our featured panelists will then give uh, case studies on how ORCID is being used at their institutions. So many thanks to our presenters today. We have Dan Coughlin at Penn State University, Sarah Pugachev at University of Rochester, and Peter Mangifico from Stanford University. Um, and then at the end, we will wrap up with discussions and questions. But if you do have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type those into the chat and we'll address them at the end. And I would also ask that everyone, if you're not speaking, to stay muted um, and just keep your camera turned off. Um, so thank you. So getting right in to uh, make sure that we're all on the same page um, for those who may be not as familiar with ORCID or maybe it's been a while since you've thought about ORCID. As a brief review, ORCID stands for the Open Researcher and Contributor Identifier. And an ORCID ID is a unique persistent identifier to distinguish individuals from each other. An ORCID ID is formatted as a URI, like you're seeing here, and links back to an ORCID record that can contain information about the individual's employment, education, works, funding, other biographical details, contributions, and activities. This is an example of my ORCID record. ORCID is different from other researcher identifiers because it's not tied to an institution or specific platform. ORCID is an independent nonprofit organization, and ORCID IDs stay with an individual over the entire course of their career, despite changes in name, institution, area of focus, location, or any other changes. ORCID is more than just name disambiguation, though. The ORCID registry and infrastructure actually provide a mechanism for interoperability between systems and workflows in the scholarly communication ecosystem that require data about individuals, their affiliations, and contributions. ORCID IDs are increasingly being used in funding, publishing, and research reporting workflows, not only to distinguish individuals from each other, but also as a time-saving approach to transferring data across the research and scholarly communication landscape. And so the ORCID API or application programming interface uh, is what makes this data transfer possible. The API is based on OAuth 2.0 and allows organizations to read data from and write data to their affiliated researchers ORCID records with the permission of that researcher. And so that reduces administrative burden in application and reporting processes and contributes to the integrity of the metadata in this ecosystem. So you can think of the ORCID API kind of like a puzzle piece that connects different systems. Um, systems that have been integrated with the ORCID API can be configured to automatically update ORCID records and connected systems when other organizations make updates in ORCID. So it's really meant to streamline data flow across systems and organizations, all with the permission of the individual researcher. So because ORCID is structured like an ecosystem, all of the stakeholders need to be involved in order for everyone to get the most benefit. For most institutions, including universities and other research institutions, there are three equally important components needed to help both the institution and the individual researchers benefit from ORCID. And those are gaining internal stakeholder support to prioritize ORCID adoption, integrating the ORCID API with local systems, and doing outreach to educate researchers about ORCID so that they will get their ORCID ID, use their ORCID ID, and researchers are central to the ORCID system. So that outreach and education component um, is just as crucial as the other two. 
So in the US, we have a national ORCID consortium for research institutions and other nonprofit organizations uh, called the ORCID US community. So our community consortium was formed in January of 2018 when Lyricist, the Big Ten Academic Alliance, the Northeast Research Libraries, and the Greater Western Library Alliance joined forces to form a national partnership for ORCID, um, with Lyricist serving as the administrative lead. Uh, we are now also partnering with the Health Research Alliance, which is a group of nonprofit health research funders in the US. And so as part of this partnership, I work to provide dedicated technical and community support for all of our ORCID members, including support for advancing the goals of the ORCID US community, which include fostering a community of practice around ORCID in the US, also establishing communication channels and enabling member institutions to share with each other. So making it as easy as possible for institutions to adopt ORCID and making sure that institutions get the most value from their ORCID membership. So currently, um, and actually, just as of June 1st, we actually have 141 institutional members right now. This is a um, map of where all of our members are currently. And now I'm going to have my colleague Shauna Sadler from ORCID talk a little bit more about the global view of ORCID membership and adoption. Great, thanks so much, Sheila, I really appreciate it. And thanks so much for uh, having me join your community call today. Uh, so US membership is strong and continu continuing to grow steadily. Uh, most of the members are universities, as you can see here. Um, some of our oldest and strongest adopters are publishers. Uh, we have more associations growing, um, joining now, particularly now that ORCID is, um, the ORCID record includes membership section. So we have associations uh, starting to write to this field on behalf of their members. Uh, US federal government agencies has, have always been a strong supporter and adopter of ORCID. Uh, we have a new US federal government consortium. Uh, it's led by the DOE and uh, many of their members are DOE labs and we are starting to have some of the US government agencies join such as the USDA. Um, technology companies uh, providing ORCID services um, have been steady, uh, are continuing to grow now. Um, we are now offering a service provider certification program. Uh, so some of these service providers who offer ORCID read write um, functionality now go through a, a certification process that we offer and uh, we provide them a graphic and we'll, we will list them as a certified program. So I think this is interesting for many of you who may be looking at different platforms for your institutions, for your organizations. And it's, you can ask some of these providers if they are ORCID certified. Okay, uh, next slide please, Sheila. So this is what uh, ORCID looks like in the Americas region right now. Uh, and I'm hoping that next time we do this community call that the Caribbean will also be included. We had a fantastic call with the university in Jamaica. And so I think um, being able to include our Caribbean colleagues would be fantastic. Uh, so in Canada, we have one consortium. We have 42 members and 22 integrations. So that's getting, um, that's getting stronger. We're doing well. Uh, as I mentioned in the US, we now have two consortia. So this Lyricist Consortium and the new US federal government uh, ORCID consortium. So in the US, we're looking at a total of 257 members with 282 integrations, which is fantastic. So that's really about the number of organizations that are both reading and writing to ORCID records. In Mexico, we're increasing our presence there. We have six members with five integrations, all universities. Uh, Brazil, we have one consortium with 13 members and 10 integrations, and those are mostly government agencies. In Chile, we're actually growing. Uh, I think we have three members now, and hopefully by end of day today, we'll have two integrations, which would be fantastic. And then in Colombia, we're getting, so Colombia and Peru, I'll say together, uh, definitely a growing interest in ORCID. So right now we're at five members and two integrations for Colombia, so that'll be increasing soon. And Peru, eight members and two integrations, but again, also increasing soon. So, so we're having tremendous energy and interest in ORCID across the Americas. Okay, next slide, please, Sheila.
And then this is a, a look at where ORCID is internationally. So the green countries are where we have national consortia like Lyricist in the US. And then the blue are where we have members but not a consortia yet. So you can see we're increasing our presence if you've been keeping track. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm hoping that little spot in the Caribbean will have some green or possibly, well, certainly blue, but hopefully green soon too. Uh, so internationally, we're looking at, I think we've just hit actually 8.7 million ORCID IDs that we've issued around the world and to uh, researchers in every, every discipline. Uh, actually, we're at 1,150 members now, as Sheila mentioned, the US, the lyricist community is continuing to grow really nicely. Europe is also growing really nicely right now too. Uh, 21 consortia and 862 integrations, which is great, but a number that we're seeing really jump right now are the number of works that are being written to the ORCID registry. And it's usually from publishers or employers like universities who are writing to researchers' records, the, uh, their publications, and their, their various uh, forms of scholarly output. Okay, so Sheila, I believe that's, those are my slides. Thank you so much, Shauna. Um, so I am pleased to now introduce our first case study speaker, Sarah Puglia from the University of Rochester. I am going to stop sharing my screen so that uh, Sarah can share hers. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, uh, can you see my PowerPoint right now? Yes, looks great. Beautiful, okay. Um, thanks so much, Sheila, for inviting me and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm happy to talk about the ORCID work we've been doing at University of Rochester. So um, I want to start out by why we're ORCID members, why we've invested a lot of energy and time into ORCID. And I think um, you can kind of consider this, or we're considering it from three different perspectives. First is the identity and reputation piece, both for individual researchers to be able to claim their works um, and you know, deal with issues like author metadata name disambiguation, and then also from a higher level as an institution, we're thinking about if we can help our uh, researchers clean up the data, how it might reflect upon us. Uh, the second kind of motivation is the time-saving workflows, and this relates really directly to the ecosystem that Sheila was talking about. So as we um, increase our local integrations and kind of lean into the uh, external integrations happening with ORCID, we can save people a lot of time, and that's something that our researchers are interested in and our administrators. And then the third is meeting requirements. So um, as you saw from uh, Shauna, there's a lot of publishers, uh, associations, funders who are interested in ORCID. So we need to be able to help our researchers uh, meet those requirements. As part of this work, we work with a lot of different types of internal stakeholders. So I've kind of broken them down here um, how I think about them. So I think about our high level administrators who are looking at the big picture of the university, what are their needs, the individual researchers, uh, domain experts. Here I would include um, our office called ORPA, which is sponsored research uh, grant interested people. Infrastructure, so thinking about our internal infrastructure, our technical people, our IT department, we have to partner with them. We have to get them on board with ORCID. And then finally, uh, departmental administrators. So the people who work most closely with researchers, um, administrators and in individual departments who are often tasked with helping researchers meet these requirements, uh, understand different grant systems. They're a real uh, group who can benefit from ORCID from the time-saving perspective. So our approach to internal stakeholders has been to focus on what kind of stakeholder we're working with, what are their needs, what are their strengths, um, for ORCID to meet their needs? Is there a way ORCID can help with the problems they're facing? And then the other thing we try to do is highlight the partnerships that we have. So University of Rochester, and I'm sure many of you are in similar situations, is a very siloed university. We like to call them cylinders of excellence. So we have a lot of great groups within the university doing work, but they're not always talking to each other. So the more we can build partnerships, and ORCID um, has been a great way to build those partnerships and then highlight them back up as this is a successful collaboration across departments. So uh, just a few more examples about these internal stakeholders and how we've approached them. So we've used the time-saving workflow uh, to talk to our IT department. So how might they help improve their systems and the faculty's experience? And I'll talk a little bit about FARS, which is our faculty activity reporting system and web profiles, um, which 
is a case where we've used this argument. This is also um, often how we approach those departmental admin and provide uh, training and outreach and encourage them to understand more about ORCID. The identity and reputation piece, um, that has been something that we've worked with the higher level administrative institution-wide administrators. So in September, um, as kind of a joint outreach and education effort, we had a letter from our provost go out to all faculty. Uh, this was co-signed by our dean of the libraries and our vice provost of global engagement. So we've been able to really get that buy-in from uh, the, that level of administrator, which has been really huge. Um, also, we worked with these internal stakeholders to develop policies, internal policies around ORCID. Um, so this last year in the spring, a few months ago, uh, which seems like a very long time ago, we instituted a requirement for our graduate students to include ORCID within their electronic theses and dissertation process. So that was a lot of back and forth. And uh, working with those stakeholders, we have to provide the expertise around ORCID and build uh, some integrations, for example, with our institutional repository. And then for the media requirements, uh, we work a lot with internal stakeholders around education here. So ORPA, as I mentioned, is um, our office. And now I've completely forgotten what the acronym stands for, but sponsored research uh, grants. So we provide the educational piece at the library. So we develop a partnership where we can uh, talk back and forth and kind of lean into our expertise. Um, also, we have a scholarly communications team in the library that I work very closely with. Um, and we have outreach uh, librarians for different departments and they're talking a lot with researchers about the publisher requirements. So I'll talk a little bit about our first ORCID integration and probably our most robust, definitely our most robust so far. So um, at University of Rochester, we had uh, a history of building our own system. So we have a home built faculty activity reporting system. Some of you may use different projects, digital measures, um, et cetera. But we have a home built one. And so it consists of three parts, teaching, research, and funding. The teaching was automatically being brought in from our LMS, which is Blackboard. But the research and funding uh, was all manually entered. And this caused two big problems. First, it's super time consuming, annoying to the researchers, the faculty especially when you get into fields where they have hundreds of publications. There's going to be typos. And there's a lot of errors. It's super annoying. So from the researcher perspective, it's frustrating. And then when you get to uh, different levels of administration, it's frustrating because the data is almost always messy and bad and hard to analyze. So we were thinking that we could bring in ORCID data to enrich these two fields and make it uh, easier interaction, similar to what was happening in the teaching section. So we did this three years ago. Um, and we've been iterating it on it every year. So the first year we just selected a few faculty who were friendly um, and willing to try it and we helped them. We, we basically, we added ourselves, or they added us as trusted individuals. We helped them populate their profiles and then tested the system. Then we had to do some refinement. We realized we needed to enrich the data and then we tried it again. And this last year, our third year, um, we continue to do refinements, but we're having a significant portion of faculty rely on this feature and um, and use it with their, with their own works. Over 100 people um, used it this year. We're also working on other integrations. I mentioned our institutional repository, which is also a home-built system. Uh, when we made that graduate requirement, we had to make sure that ORCIDs would work with there. It's not quite an API integration right now. It's just a field for ORCIDs, but that's something we're refining. We're also working on web profiles. So a lot of our faculty have web pages with publications that are vastly out of date. They may maintain their own web page elsewhere, but uh, their publication list may be from 2010, which isn't super valuable to them. Uh, and it's really problematic when grad students are looking for uh, potential faculty advisors. So we're working on a pilot to help uh, pro populate that information from ORCID as well. I have a screenshot here of our uh, integration tool. So we have uh, one place where every, you can link your ORCID, and this adds uh, University of Rochester as a trusted individual to your ORCID. We're also using this integration site as a place to put FAQs, um, how to reach your librarian with more con uh, information around ORCID, some kind of general information to get help sends me an email. So we're trying to make it easy for people to get all the ORCID information they want in one place. And that's been one of our outreach strategies. So I mentioned we have the centralized information page. Um, I also want to emphasize that we started small and grew. So uh, we only started by reaching a few faculty in each department, and then we kind of built from there. 
And our outreach librarians or subject librarians are always the first point of contact for these faculty. They already have relationships with faculty. They know their faculty's needs. Um, so it made sense to utilize that as kind of spreading the word about ORCID. We're also, in terms of outreach, developing services around the requirements. Uh, for example, this year, around kind of our faculty activity reporting system, the month before it was due, we started a temporary pop-up service where faculty could add their librarian as a trusted individual, and they would check the last year of publications and funding uh, within the ORCID profiles to help that uh, be up to date. We had over 100 people participate this year, and uh, many of them without ORCID, so having that little extra service around it really helped. We're also trying to embed ORCID in other conversations um, that we're already having with faculty. So I do a workshop on scholarly identity. We always make sure ORCID's included in that. Um, our scholarly communications team, when they're talking about faculty, uh, they're emphasizing ORCID and how it's part of this ecosystem as well. And uh, we're also trying to target our ORCID outreach for our audience. So we need to have a very different pitch for graduate students who are starting their career versus uh, tenured faculty who are considering retirement. It also varies by discipline. So humanities faculty have a lot different needs than science faculty who are maybe focused on the grant part of ORCID. Finally, I just want to share a few of the lessons we've learned over the past three years. Uh, what's worked really well for us is by starting small, picking the one integration that we thought we could do, but thinking long term about how we might build that and building our integration so uh, that it can be transferred to other um, data sources or data outputs that we might need. And I think uh, this past year, one thing we've really been working on is understanding the needs for our different stakeholder groups, specifically how our ORCID relate. Uh, one thing we've done is we've launched a local group to investigate how ORCID is relevant to humanities and arts faculty um, at University of Rochester because they were kind of being a little bit left behind um, in our kind of ORCID promotional material. And then we've also continued to ask ourselves the questions, how do our integrations provide extra incentives to use ORCID? There's already a lot of external incentives, uh, requirements, uh, you know, buying into that ecosystem, but what can we do to make it easier? What can we do to make more efficient workflows? Um, I've already mentioned a couple of times curating those pitches, and this is the probably the next one is the hardest thing for me to accept that not everyone will be on board with ORCID, and that's okay. Um, so I've had uh, conversations where people are really, um, they're not going to do it, they're not going to like it. Um, and there's nothing you can do to convince them, but you can, to get to my last point, you can establish yourself and your team as ORCID expertise and to go to person if you know that researcher or that stakeholder ever, you know, hears about ORCID. They're like, mm, I remember Sarah in the library talking about ORCID. Let's talk to her. And one thing that's been really great about establishing that ORCID expertise is it establishes for us a broader kind of departmental and library expertise that yes, uh, libraries know quite a lot about scholarly identity and we're interested in it and we're willing to help. So kind of uh, promoting ORCID and leaning into those ORCID integrations has been great for us to establish those expertise and build those partnerships which can extend to other projects. And with that, I'm going to stop so other people can share. Uh, I saw some questions. Um, we have a Q and the A at the end, so I won't answer questions now, but I put my contact info here um, I'd love to talk more about ORCID uh, if anyone wants to reach out directly as well. And I'll stop right there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. So yes, um, do feel free to continue typing questions into the chat and we will get to them at the end. Um, but next up, I want to introduce our next presenter um, from Penn State University, Dan Coughlin. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Thanks. Thanks, Sheila um, and ORCID for inviting me to talk. And thanks, Sarah, for uh, going through what your institution's doing. It's kind of reaffirming to see other folks doing some things that uh, look kind of similar to some of what we're doing at Penn State. Um, and so I currently work um, at the university libraries as head of strategic technologies, which is essentially our IT department within the libraries. Um, but prior to coming to the libraries, I worked in our central IT unit. Um, and at one point I was involved in technologies that we used for authentication and authorization at the university. And we handled a lot of identity and access management 
And I mention that because it's kind of relevant and that I've spent time with the folks at our university that run systems that, you know, would integrate with ORCID. And I think it's allowed us to be involved um, and we have a good relationship there. So, you know, as Sarah mentioned, universities are pretty complex. So many times for us, it isn't necessarily the technology as much as finding the right person or, you know, an advocate or someone to talk to that also believes an initiative is worthy of making, um, making it a priority. And so why are we an ORCID member? Um, right, some of the benefits of being an ORCID member, uh, name disambiguation for researchers. You know, it's like a layer above the university level. So as faculty move around, they can keep a single identifier for things like grants, publications, faculty activities. Um, currently <clears throat> helps reduce faculty burden for grant proposals um, for some funding agencies and also collected from various journals to help with the name disambiguation and in, in contributions. Um, additionally, probably one of the like, more practical reasons that Penn State you know, has a lot of pride around identity management and has for quite some time. Um, our, the current Vice President for Trust and Identity Services at Internet2 was the Penn State CIO for um, nearly a decade, right? So we had leadership during, um, from about 2008, 2015, that really saw value in identity, identity services. Um, and it wasn't necessarily something we needed to sell to the IT side of the house. Um, initially our IT department was the one promoting this and trying to push ORCID forward at our university. Um, and so we were early adopters of single sign-on federated identities with Shibboleth. And so this seemed like a natural organization for us to member with. Um, so we did a really good job of, you know, knowing your identity at Penn State and when you're doing Penn State things, but you go to NSF or NIH or publish an article on your research, you're no longer with, you know, within the Penn State digital jurisdiction, so to speak. So at that point, we have a very difficult time figuring out who you are or if you're the person with the same name as we assume. Um, and at one point in the past couple of years, we paid for a list of all Penn State open access uh, publication output. And that's a really small uh, image of it, but it was essentially a spreadsheet that we purchased. And each line had a publication with, you know, that type of information, title, journal, list of authors, determining which of those authors was the Penn State contributor was extremely difficult, right? Um, here's how authors would appear, which is on first blush looks pretty good. They're separated by author with that vertical bar. Um, but then you start asking, um, was the person still at Penn State either when it was published or are they here today? If they aren't still here, when will they have, you know, we'll have a tough time looking them up in the directory. Which one of these authors is the Penn State author? Um, do we have their full name? Didn't their name change? Um, something seemingly so simple, right? Here's a Penn State, here's a spreadsheet rather of publications, they're open access, there's Penn State contributors became very complex and we're spending all of our time on that name disambiguation, uh, lack of standards around citation formats, make that persistent identifier and authors very valuable for being able to track research output. All right, so we have the DOI, if you can see over in that left corner, excuse me, um, for the research output, right? But uh, to persistently identify that research output, but we need ORCID to, persist, to persistently identify the contributors, right? So, so those are some of our reasons for becoming an ORCID member. Um, and how we approach stakeholders. Um, I'm separating our stakeholders, our partners, really for us in a bit of terms of implementers at the systems level. So who's gonna do some of the technical work and that's Penn State IT and the university libraries. And then, you know, educators, who's going to socialize and train folks in what's been done. And that's largely our liaison librarians, um, the office of the senior vice president for research and our graduate school. So we would approach our stakeholders generally to see where we, <clears throat> where we align and how big of a priority ORCID is for their unit and the resources they're able to dedicate to make something happen. So for example, one of the interests for the graduate school is the name disambiguation for international students during the application process. That's not really something that we in the libraries are too involved in the application process for the graduate students. So it's nice to have them as an advocate, but I don't, you know, there's not really um, an area that we're going to work with them on that implementation. But two other of our, the big stakeholders, right, are we've, that we've worked with are the Office of the Senior Vice President for Research and Penn State IT. And so Penn State IT, we've worked very closely with them because um, from a technical implementation perspective, they're our most important partner that we have. Um, 
the Penn State IT department's largely responsible for your digital identity. So any work with an external identifier, such as ORCID, will rely on an integration with that Penn State identifier. And so um, the Office of the Senior Vice President for Research is largely interested in areas of integration, right, with a lot of external systems that um, Sarah mentioned before previously, right? So grant funding and the reporting out on research. And so this is an area we are aligned with and trying to make some things happen here that I'll talk about in a bit with our integrations. But ultimately we've been working with these groups based on how <clears throat> well our respective implementations or integrations with ORCID align. So briefly, some of our imp implementations, you can link your Penn State Access ID to your ORCID. Um, I don't have a screenshot of this workflow because I'm going to show a similar workflow in the, in the sake of time. I'll kind of <laughs> spare you on that. Um, but basically, you log in with your Penn State account to a service at Penn State. Then you log into ORCID. And if you have an ORCID ID, it links your Penn State, <clears throat> your Penn State ID and your ORCID ID. And if you don't have an ID, then it creates an ORCID for you and links them together. And by links them together, I really just mean Penn State now stores that ORCID in a central database that um, you know, anyone within Penn State can access and, and know what your ORCID is. The second implementation, again, similar, um, so we've done or we've turned on is with digital measures, which that's our faculty um, activity reporting system. Um, so for those not familiar, Digital Measures is a vendor-hosted software product used for faculty reporting. So faculty can import records that exist in ORCID to their Digital Measures account. So it's sort of a one-way um, communication. You can write content. Um, you can't write content from Digital Measures to ORCID. You can write content from ORCID to Digital Measures. So on this screen, you can see that I can import content from ORCID or another number of other providers. but um, if I select ORCID and click search, I'll uh, see the publications that exist in ORCID that I can then import um, into digital measures as you go through a, a workflow for that process. So this screen I'm displaying is step one of four in the import process within digital measures. The last implementation I'll discuss is in currently in progress. Um, our metadata database is largely a citation index um, and it has other information that you may find in like a faculty profile, we use it for um, to support that. Um, it gets content from several sources, digital measures being one of them, Web of Science, um, Scopus, NSF, our HR system, the Penn State Directory, our electronic thesis and dissertation system. Um, so it's got a lot of information there. Uh, the use case that this database supports is our open access policy. Um, like I said, it also has all this rich metadata so we could share with um, ORCID for profiles that are used outside of Penn State, and perhaps more importantly, in the near term, uh, federal agencies can use content from ORCID to populate grant proposals and, again, reduce faculty burden as they're putting their proposals together. So I'll show some screenshots of our metadata database and workflow to push ORCID, to put, <clears throat> sorry, to push information into ORCID. Um, so if you log in, uh, you can view your own information. It's a bit like a pro public profile for a researcher. So you can see the links along navigation for some metadata like publications, presentations, and performances. Um, currently, we're highlighting bio so I could see um, the organization that Eric Durani currently works for. And on the right side, um, I can connect my ORCID ID. Right. Um, and so you can click that button, register or connect. So the next screen that you would be brought to is you enter your ORCID account information to sign into ORCID. Um, and now that I've signed into ORCID um, and completed the authentication process, you see the button at the bottom of my organization record that says add to my ORCID record, <laughs> right? Um, and so on the slide a few screens back, that button wasn't there. Also, we're, um, we're able to use that nice green button, which is nice because most of our Penn State standards require us to use blue, so it makes the screen a little bit more um, enjoyable, a little more colorful for us. Um, but you click that add to re um, ORCID record and you could see the message right uh, up at the top, the employment record was successfully added to your ORCID record, right? So great, right? Um, that information has been pushed to ORCID, but let's verify it and see what, see what it looks like now on the ORCID side. So if you go to the ORCID website, you can see um, on the sort of lower portion of the screen in the trusted organizations on the lower left, 
right? Penn State University listed as a trusted organization. That happened when we signed in on the other screen. And if you look all the way to the right, um, you see access type, right? Add, update your research activities, works, affiliation. So that's the permission that allows our application to write to ORCID. Um, and so now if we look at our actual record, right, we can see, we can look at our ORCID um, profile and you can see that Penn State was able to update that employment record within your ORCID profile. <clears throat> so um, for outreach um, and sort of lessons learned, uh, we haven't done a lot of outreach to our researchers at this point. It's something that we've held back on because we didn't have or we don't have all the integrations set up yet uh, to provide researchers with the benefit that we're hoping to provide with this latest integration. So we believe once we get the metadata database integrated where you can write works and um, hopefully increase that 56 million number that they were talking about um, earlier and such to ORCID, then the funding agencies are using this information to populate grant proposals. Um, we'll have a real benefit for our researchers. So right now we've got hundreds, maybe over a thousand that have integrated their ORCID and Penn State account. Um, but we haven't made a real push yet to get into the multiple thousands of researchers. Um, and I'd find, you know, something that you could, I'd, I'd recommend finding something that you could create as a real advantage down the road to try to see how you can gain traction and by prioritizing that. So for example, the NSF, if you're familiar with that, the bio sketches um, for the grant proposals, if you can get content into ORCID for faculty, so that they can integrate ORCID and then Science CV. Um, that's a huge win. I think you'll get support for something like that. Um, there's a good deal of complexity in some of this. So find people that are gonna be excited about it. And if you can, just take on the small pieces at a time um, and find those pieces that'll have the biggest impact for your university. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Peter to discuss what they're doing at Stanford. Wonderful, thanks so much, Dan. Um, and yes, uh, next up we have Peter Mangifico from Sanford University. Wonderful, I can see your screen. And a note to everyone, great questions coming into the chat. Please do continue to type those questions in and we will answer them right after Peter's presentation. All right, thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Peter Mangifico. I'm at Stanford University. Um, I, I work in the library as well, so. <clears throat> um, and I, I'm, I guess I'm lucky to go after Sarah and Dan because they've, they've already laid sort of a lot of good groundwork and I'm probably going to be sounding somewhat repetitive. Um, so wh wh why is um, Stanford an ORCID member? Um, I, we've heard it. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, persistent identifiers, we've heard that um, for researchers have, have many benefits. I won't go through them. Um, uh, and really, it's it, one of them, of course, is for this cross institutional um, identifier, which follows people as they as they you know, progress in their career. Um, we've we found that ORCID is integrating with a growing list of tools. So people people don't you know even if you have sort of a, an institutional system, researchers will use tools that that allow them to do their work, and those tools may or may not be part of your institution. It's important to to sort of you know co coexist peacefully with other tools, um, and and we and Stanford is very interested in being part of this sort of joint effort to to work on these problems. But I guess in short, I'm you know like name disambiguation is hard, and we've heard this. And names are just not a great way of identifying researchers. And those of us that are technologists and um, you know use things like IP addresses and DNS servers and so on are kind of like have this idea of like hey why are we using this really hard thing to uniquely identify people but, but we do um, and and sort of to you know extend the sphere outward it's it, it it's important to do that not just for people I think but all the things that they produce the papers and data sets and equipment so you know we have some of these things like DOIs and or, you know ORCID for researchers and so on but there's you know lab equipment and clinical trials and drugs which are sometimes identified by names and you know what thinking forward what would be great is if we could effectively build a research knowledge graph sort of akin to what um, Facebook does with the social graph, right? Let's let's knit these things together, and then we can start answering some some interesting questions. And it's it's really hard to do that, even th even though you may be able to connect, even though you may be able to collect all the information in a system, if you can't reliably connect it 
um, it's basically a, it's a very, very hard task. And we've, we've seen that firsthand in our sort of initial attempts at building like a, a research analytics platform. And like the very first problem we have is we can't uniquely identify people and we missed attribute papers and research to people they should not be attributed to. And, it, and the, the problem becomes especially pervasive when you try and do this across all institutions. Like if we wanna look at all the research being produced at Stanford and then look at all the people that they collaborate with and try and understand that in this totality, that is a massive number of people that you need to disambiguate. Okay, um, so benefits for Stanford under this, sorry if this, these are like very bullet pointy kind of slides, but um, so um, we, you know, this, there's, this a, it's a growing requirement from, fun, from funders and publishers. I, I mentioned before, there's integrations with a growing number of, of tools so that, you know, we can, um, uh, we, we, I talked about disambiguation. Um, we, we want to, we, so I'll get to this on a future slide, but I guess I'll say it now. I mean, when we're thinking about um, ORCID and how to sort of promote its use within the institution, what we're really um, thinking about is what what tangential benefit are we you know provide like how how is this tool that we're asking people to utilize you know further the goals that they have for themselves which is you know how, how does it further their research goals or their or their academic their teaching goals and how can we kind of make sure that the um, the processes that and tools that we're asking people to use actually serve those ultimate needs like are we actually serving the mission of Stanford by by using these tools and so we when we look at ways that we can help them integrate with tools that they may already use or help them get credit for their work, which could help them with funding. These are, these are the sort of the, the things we think about when we think of this, this benefit. Um, you know, like if we can build a research graph using ORCID as an identifier for researchers, maybe we can help identify unique funding opportunities that they may not be aware of or contributors or collaborators that are sort of outside their obvious circle. So, um, and, and we, we tend to, at least the library at Stanford, I've, I've heard that sort of so the, the siloed, I mean, Stanford is like a lot of academic institution is, can be somewhat siloed, um, but at least in the libraries, we really like the idea of um, collaborating with open source and more open projects rather than commercial alternatives. Okay, um, so how do we how do, we do outreach? Um, and it's it's very it's very distributed. I mean, we have some some you know internal communication tools that we use to try and coordinate. Um, you know, the, the the I think we've found that being sort of at a grassroots effort is a great way of connecting with researchers directly rather than trying to do sort of like mass communications, which are are sometimes um, can uh, be tuned out by by researchers who are, who are already whose plates are already full. But by by sort of doing the outreach more locally in you know at, at sort of at sort of the front lines, which could be librarians or um, department administrators, we can sort of more effectively reach the the people we're trying to reach. And again, the, the goals are are to um, just to you know sort of provide guidance on here's here's what it will get you and help how it will, it will help you do your job if you're whether you're a researcher, or an administrator, or someone's trying to understand or collect data or do like, you know, mandated reporting to funding agencies. Um, and so we use things like mailing lists and, um, you know, and, and we have, there's like a core group of us that meet monthly to sort of coordinate strategies and talk about things that we found that have been effective or, or, or not effective. Um, this is the growth in ORCID usage at Stanford. So just by looking at ORCID registrations that have at stanford.edu, um, it's, uh, this is just going back a year, um, but you know, we've seen, 30, uh, you know, roughly a 33% increase over the course of a year. The growth is pretty consistent. Um, you know, we have, we sort of had a, a big shutdown event over here, um, which was, at, I'm sure, obviously impacted everyone. It, it shut down the, the quarter like, like two weeks before. So faculty scrambled to figure out how to, to teach remotely. Um, there was, you know, it was a pretty disruptive event and yet um, the line kept going up. So that's, that's good. Um, so current work at API integrations at, at Stanford, there's, we're, we're pretty early on here. We just have one integration currently using the API 
And it's, it's effectively just a way of connecting the, um, a person's Stanford identifier with an ORCID. And so um, we, we do, I think, something similar to what, what Dan was showing, where we um, have a page where someone can, um, I've got a couple screenshots here. This is the, the sort of the Stanford single sign-on, um, where if you, if you go to the ORCID integration page, um, and you haven't signed in with your Stanford ID, you'll get this page. Um, you'll then get sort of this Stanford branded thing saying, hey, this is ORCID, here's what, here's what it is. You can connect it, um, or you know, if, if you already have it, um, you'll, you'll see your existing connection there. Um, I guess I'm, uh, yeah. Um, and you know, here's the ORCID registration page. So it's just a, it's a very lightweight, simple interaction. Um, and, um, once it's done, the, this is sort of step one we felt is to at least in, our, uh, in a central system at Stanford have a link between sort of the Stanford identifier and this ORCID. And we want to do it in a central location so that other Stanford systems and sort of this distributed um, you know, universe we live in, we can, we can at least have a single point of, of authority for the, this connection. We didn't really want different departments and different schools like the School of Medicine to do it differently than the, the university and so on. So we really wanted to coordinate and make sure this happened in one place. Um, so we, we have plans for other integrations. Um, I've listed them here. There's, there's some credentialing integrations where we can um, essentially uh, push to the ORCID profile um, uh, training that has happened so we can provide sort of a, a credit to the researchers for having done this. Um, we have a, a homegrown pro, a faculty profile system that right now uses um, the Web of Science and PubMed as its two sources for publications, but we really know that we want to integrate with ORCID in, in sort of both directions. Like one is uh, populating an ORCID profile with publications that have been um, confirmed in a user's profile, but also go the other way so we can take advantage of other sources that may come into, into ORCID profile directly. And then um, we can make some institutional assertions on someone's on someone's work and profile to validate their, you know, what they are saying of themselves on their work and profile that Stanford asserts that those are true. Um, so what are lessons learned? I, I kind of mentioned some of these earlier. Um, it's important to use all available communication channels we found because not all people pay attention to the same channels. So, you know, whether it's email or or Twitter or blog posts or go to faculty meetings like in person, just like it's, it's okay to be duplicative because not everyone's tuning into the same things. Um, that, you know, people are very busy. We all know this. Um, we sort of are in the world of understanding work and understanding its benefits, but not everyone is in that world. And they, they, may, they may have like 30 seconds to understand why I should be doing this or make this connection. Hey, you really need to create an ORCID ID and then you need to connect to your, you know, here the like, you may have a really short window of time. So, or, you know, the interaction needs to be as frictionless as possible, um, we, we believe. Um, and the researchers really need to understand what, what's in it for them. What it, so the, the theoretical and sort of aspirational um, is, is not sufficient. Um, and it really, it really needs to actually reduce their burden to get sufficient buy-in. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, we know there's going to be all sorts of potential challenges and we, I've, talking to faculty members, I've heard this more than once. Oh, I probably have like two or three orchids because like I, at one point I was trying to do something and I needed to get one so I got one and then like six months later I, I got to another place where I needed one and I forgot my first one so I just, it was easier just to make a second one, right? We know that's happening so we have to think about that. Um, and I think that's all I've got. So that's, that's my contact information and happy to more. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you again to all of our presenters today. Um, we do have about 10 minutes for questions, and I know we already have some um, in the chat, um, but also I do want to point out that um, beyond this webinar, uh, the ORCID US community does have our own website in addition to the ORCID website, so you can go there. Um, you can email orchidus at lyricist.org for any additional questions or anything that you have. And please do also follow us on Twitter. Um, but let's get into the questions. Let me pull up that chat. 
Um, standby, it's not coming up for some reason. Oh, there it is. Okay, so um, the first question I think is for Sarah. Um, at University of Rochester. What source of publications do you recommend? My understanding is that Crossref automatically populates ORCID profiles, but not others. And how much of your work time goes toward ORCID related work? Those are great questions. Um, I'll say we use, we rely on Scopus a lot when someone's first setting up a profile. Um, if they're well represented in Scopus, then it's really easy to pull everyone in using kind of the search and leak features. Um, Crossref is another source that we use fairly often, I think, and maybe others can jump on this. The issue that arises with kind of some profiles, auto updating, some not, is that researchers have to actually opt in for their profiles to auto update. And they have to also be giving their ORCID to publishers. So it kind of goes through that workflow in the first time a paper goes through the workflow, they have to authorize Crossref to continuously update it. So there's a little bit of education piece that we find around Crossref, but once it's set up, it seems to work really well. Of course, uh, there's some disciplines that aren't well represented, certainly not in Scopus. I'm thinking arts and humanities. Um, and so sometimes we will help faculty manually add information to ORCID if it's not being represented in the databases. As for time, uh, my percent of time spent on ORCID, it varies. I would say it's becoming less and less. It's becoming more uh, self-supported. There were periods, you know, maybe a year ago where I was spending 20% of my time uh, supporting ORCID, but it seems to be less and seems to be a self-sustaining process. Um, I'm not doing any of the technical integration, so there's times where um, Nate, who is my technical lead, is spending some time on it. But I think we're finally getting to the point where it's kind of self-sustaining. Thanks, Sarah. Dan and Peter, do you want to chime in also around uh, thoughts about the amount of time, you know, that maybe you personally or your teams have spent working on ORCID initiatives? Um, for this is Dan. Um, so I think for Penn State, it's largely I mean, most of our time is in spurts, I would say. So when we want to add something or create a feature, it's not necessarily like consistent operational kind of um, work. So right now we, we had just recently um, got the integration to push things into um, into ORCID from the metadata database. And we're going to continue working on that with publications. So that was probably you know, a, a month of, of work between, between, you know, getting things set up. Um, and it's probably another month before we're finished with the publications. Um, after that, I mean, it kind of depends on how much detail we want to go in. Um, and so what I mean by that is like, do we want the records to be updated um, between the two systems or synced basically between the two systems? It could, you could spend a lot of time on it. We, we um, I would say most of it is just in the initial kind of development of things. So once you have, have something there. Um, there's not a lot of development time. Outreach and communication is probably where you spend a bigger amount of time once that's there. Great, thanks Dan. Peter, did you want to chime in? I, I, would, I was gonna say basically exactly what Dan said, so not much to add. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so looking at the, uh, oh, and I just wanted to add one more thing about the question um, about Crossref. Um, within the ORCID record, in the works section, there is what is called search and link wizards. So that's a number of databases like Scopus and PubMed. Crossref and DataCite are currently the only two that provide the automatic updates that the researcher does have to um, uh, authorize the first time, as Sarah mentioned. So Crossref and DataCite are the two main organizations that mint DOIs for publications. So once that initial connection is made, as long as the researcher um, is publishing and their publication has a DOI and they've submitted their ORCID ID with the publication, then they can see their work starting to be automatically added to their ORCID record for them. So that also saves a lot of time. Um, okay, now looking at the rest of the questions, I think this is a question for Dan. Um, is the metadata index a homegrown system or on a hosted platform? Um, yeah, that's a homegrown system. So uh, a lot for, for what we found a lot of the 
sort of vendor products seemed to um, <laughs> seem to be like, hey, this is the one system. Um, and obviously there's a bit of hypocrisy in us saying like, no, we'll create the one system, not yours. Uh, but it just, it's allowed us to get more information and maybe richer, met, richer metadata to not only produce faculty profiles and kind of prevent a fracturing on our campus of who's using what API for faculty profiles, um, but also um, promote open access for us. And just from the fracturing of faculty profiles for us, we have both pure um, and digital measures. And so we have some people that were, hey, we're gonna use the pure API. Some people are gonna use the digital measures API. And so we figured if we kind of aggregated all the data into one spot, had one API, then hopefully that would reduce the number of people that need to make API updates or need to do um, security updates and try to keep really the, the data consistent for folks. Great, thanks, Dan. And just to add to that, um, just a note about vendor systems. If you are using a vendor system, um, it, it can be a little more limited than having your own homegrown or open source system that you can customize. Some vendor systems, depending on what you're using, have some ORCID functionality built in that if your organization is an ORCID member, you can turn on that functionality. Um, but it's still limited to what the vendor supplies. So for the ORCID US community, we also have email templates for a variety of different vendor systems. Um, and if you send an email to me at orchidus at lyricist.org um, uh, and tell me what systems you're using, I can point you to the email templates that we have so that you can, as a customer, reach out to your vendors and ask them to um, either build in ORCID functionality or add more ORCID functionality, um, that kind of thing. Um, okay, so it looks like we have a question for Peter. Um, how did you convince administration to not allow, for example, the Stanford School of Medicine to do their own integration? So basically, how did you get everyone on board to do this centralized integration instead of different units doing their own thing? Uh, luck, maybe. Um, and we um, so we're not we we can't convince anyone to um, to do anything, um, but we can um, coordinate and sort of um, try and sort of convince people that of the benefits of having a central location. Um, and then I I think um, sort of you know offering to do the work is. Is, is helpful. Um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say we convinced anyone. It's more that we um, came up with a strategy and and you know sort of had internal like strategizing sessions and you know socialize the idea um, and just tried to to convince various people to that this was the best approach. Thanks, Peter. That that makes a lot of sense. Um, we do just to add on to that. Um, you know, recognizing the kind of sometimes siloed nature of institutions um, are the community consortium. We have some resources uh, and guidance and best practices, you know, recommendations available for how to talk to other stakeholders. That's actually something that we're continuing to work on this year is creating more materials that can help guide you know someone in the library for example on how to talk to somebody in central IT or other units um, and it really does vary from one institution to the next it, it depends a lot on the actual individuals that are in the positions uh, with decision making authority and um, you know existing relationships between different individuals and different departments so it really does depend on your local context and what might work best for you working with your own internal stakeholders. Um, okay, um, are there any other questions? We are, we are right at the hour, but if there are any last minute burning questions, I will, I will take them. Feel free to either unmute and pipe up or type into the chat any last minute burning questions. And if not, or while you're thinking, just FYI, I will be sharing this recording to everyone who registered, um, and we will be sharing the slides as well. Um, so please stay tuned for that. 
Um, thank you all again so much for joining the webinar today. I hope it was helpful and I hope that you will all join us in continuing these conversations and sharing um, so that we can continue to create our community of practice around ORCID in the US. And don't hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions, comments, anything else that you um, want to let us know. Um, and with that, I think I think we can conclude. So thanks again, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day um, and a good rest of your week and weekend and, and on into the future. So thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Jill. See you next time.